and I'm going to go ahead and start, okay? Thank you. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, and welcome to How to Verify and Calibrate Your Articulators. My name is Sarah Brom, and I will be facilitating today's webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few things. First, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the question box, which should be on your right-hand side of your screen, and we'll answer all questions at the end of the webinar. This webinar is approved to one NBC credit, and you'll receive an email within 24 hours that gives you instructions on how to obtain your credit. So now I'd like to introduce Jim Robinson. Jim is a certified dental technician with more than 30 years' experience. He has used many of the most popular articulator instrumentations currently on the market. He works at Whitmix as our institutional field manager. As part of his job, he visits various schools calibrating and repairing articulators, giving him a wealth of knowledge and experience in this area. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, and good morning. Uh, this morning we're going to talk about, uh, actually talking about the new verification gauges available uh, from Whitmix for the Danar, Hanau, and Whitmix articulators. So uh, to start out, I want to talk about the actually are three gauges. One gauge for the Hanau, Danar articulators, a separate gauge for the Whitmix articulator, and then uh, also another separate gauge for the Mark 300 series articulator, which is our newest articulator from the Danar line. All these gauges are set to verify the accuracy of the articulators check to see if they're still in calibration. Now with some of these articulators, uh, and more so with the, the Danar, you are able to calibrate some or actually all of the articulator using the verification gauge. What I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to go over and go over kind of a full process of how to calibrate and verify that you're in calibration with the Danar articulator, and also in not as much detail, but some of the same, some things you want to look for when you're, if you're using a wit mix or a Hanau articulator, so we're going to spend more time on the Danar, knowing that some of these same things apply to the other two instruments. So if we look at the uh, gauge, verification gauge for the Hanau Danar, it includes an upper and lower gauge with matching steel numbers, and you'll see this here uh, a little later on. It also comes with three thumb screws, and there's a longer screw that's used on the upper member of the wide view. For those of you who have the Hanau instruments, you know that the upper member of the, for the wide view is a little bit thicker than the lower member. It also has a verification pin and two dowel pins. So with the Dano articulators, you're able to verify and calibrate all of the instruments, or excuse me, all parts of the instruments, except for the Mark 300 series articulator. So why is this important to us? Well, for many years, you know, it, it, people in the lab or in the office have been trying to figure out a way to calibrate, or at least check the calibration between the articulators that they may have had in the lab or in the office. So now we're in their customers are starting to require request more of this type of ability to do this. And so, so this is kind of why it's important that we come with a gauge that allows you to do this today. It gives you assurance that the mounted cast can be interchanged between the same model or type of articulator. And also, uh, for those who send models, mounted models out to laboratories, uh, what you've had to do in the past was you had to send the whole case mounted on the articulator out to your laboratory and back and forth in shipping. So by using a, a calibration device that keeps your instruments calibrated within your office or your lab, you only need to send the mounted models or the cast out to the laboratory. This is going to save you some cost and certainly any unwanted damage to the articulator that could be caused during shipping. Now, how it's accomplished in the past? Well, I remember about 30 years ago when I came into the laboratory working for a prosthodontist. He actually had a way where he had me take some nails and cut the nails off level and using some uh, low expansion mounting stone or mounting plaster actually had me embed some nails, much as you see here in this picture, uh, nails into the plaster and close the articulate down uh, to the zero mark. And hopefully, uh, as we would use the instruments, we could put the uh, base back on the articulator and check the position of the nails to see if they were still in calibration or to, to at least to what we had at that degree. So if you look to the right, you see where the articulator is opened up a little bit, showing you the nails do separate. And when you close them down, like you see on the left, they should be, uh, we would hope, that they're going to line up exactly as we place them to begin with. Now, there's some, uh, air, why, why at least the reason this wouldn't work would be because sometimes the nails are going to get bent, and over time, uh, the stone is going to wear, and the nails just kind of start to wiggle around. So this wasn't a, a great, uh, it, was, it was a good idea to check the calibration within your lab, but really didn't have, couldn't do much else with it. There was also there are some laboratories that uh, I have seen where they had used a uh, some type of a, a gauge. Right here, this is made out of just plaster, 
And with this, they're just using, uh, they pour some, again, plaster in like a low expansion mounting stone or plaster. And with a new instrument, they would, they would pour up this, this gauge, as you see here. And uh, you can see on the right-hand side, when you, if, you, if it's open, you would have a little gap in between the two uh, blocks. Or if it's closed, like you see on the left, that's what you would like to see on the articulator. Again, this is a, a great idea, but it, it really didn't give you any way to really calibrate the instrument. And also, uh, you can imagine using this gauge or this type of uh, device over and over again, the stones would start to erode, and you were not, would not be able to really use it you know, as you would for really calibrating the instrument. So these are some ideas that I've seen done in the past, and uh, it works to some degree, but not as, not as to the degree of what we'd like to see uh, today. More rec most recently, tools, uh, type of tools that were used for check calibration involve this metal, uh, what we call check device. And as you see here, it actually has two blocks with two cylinders that are attached to the blocks. And the blocks, of course, get attached to the articulator. And then the idea was, it was to, when you close the articulator down, this is in calibration, the cylinders will be perfectly aligned. And you can actually take this check ring that you see off to the left and actually slide the ring up and down the cylinder to where there was no in, should be no interference. The ring should be able to, you should be able to lift the ring up and let it drop to the bottom without any interference where the two halves of the cylinder come together. And so this is a great, this is a nice a great way to calibrate the articulator. This is what we were using uh, pretty much until actually just about a couple of years ago. And this is what it would look like on the articulator when you're actually checking for your calibration. There are some other tools that have been used and, and tried. This is another technique that's used by another manufacturer where we actually take this, uh, this device and put it onto the articulator. But as you see here, using a glue of some sort uh, or epoxy uh, to hold the articulator together, it can get quite messy. And we also know that there could be some expansion that's taking place. And uh, also it takes some time to, for the glue or the, as you see it, the resin to maybe set up on the instrument. So there was, there's some negative uh, to use it even this now, also, for those of you who are using the, the Danar instrument uh, in the past, you may recognize the, what we call the field inspection gauge. It's very precise, although it's very technique sensitive. It requires a little bit of training to use the instrument. And what you would do here is, as you would view through the little eyepieces, what you're trying to do is line up some uh, lines on a crosshair, and you're adjusting these knobs very slowly uh, at a time to get the instrument into calibration. And if you've ever used this, uh, you'll, you'll remember, you'll, or you'll probably know that as you're using the gauge, it, it, it is very technique sensitive. And you tend to think you have it perfectly lined up as you go to lock a screw down, or any slight movement will cause it to be out of alignment. So this was kind of difficult to use and somewhat frustrating if you were trying to calibrate and if you have several cal in instruments to calibrate within your laboratory. So today, though, we have what is called a verification gauge. And as you see in this photograph, uh, it is very, it's labeled so that you know that you don't, you, don't, you can't get it mixed up. Uh, as you see in this photograph here, the DNA signifies it as a Danar handout gauge, and it's actually listed where one is for the upper and one goes on the lower, and as you can see, they are sterilized. So this is what we're going to talk about today as far as what you would use to calibrate your instrument in your lab or in your office. Now, before you do any uh, calibration, the first big step in, in the calibrating is to clean, and I would emphasize clean and clean again, and check your articulator before attaching the verification gauge. The instrument that you're using is a very precise instrument. So certainly periodic cleaning and proper care and maintenance will give you many years of, of, of level, high level interchangeability. Although this is not a presentation that's showing you how to go step by step what to look for for cleaning and care and maintenance, uh, this is something you want, you want to become familiar with and you want to use. And, so, and it's hard to really give you a when is a good time to do any cleaning or maintenance. But I would certainly say that any time you're using something on your instrument and, you, and it doesn't look like it's coming together uh, quite the way it should, as to the, like when you took it out of the box, that might be a good time to do, uh, take some time to kind of look at the instrument, look the instrument over and clean it up. Uh, just make sure that it does go together and it's working like you, like you felt it would work or it was working when you took it out of the box. Uh, those, you can also look at your instruction manual. It does kind of give you some instructions for cleaning and performing maintenance on the, on the instrument. Now, just for today, though, I'm going to go ahead and kind of give you some just real quick uh, review or summary of what we would recommend you do. So for cleaning, I recommend you use a mild soap and water solution 
with a, a soft brush for cleaning it. And you always want to air dry and lubricate the working parts of the instrument once you're finished with the cleaning. Uh, do not use strong detergents, alkalis, gasoline, or naphtha as a cleaning agent. And also do not use a steam cleaner for prolonged periods. We know that it's probably it's okay to do a real quick blast of some of the instruments, but we know that it, as I've seen a lot of technicians or a lot of people doing when they clean the instruments, we tend to to stay on that one part of the instrument for a period, a long period of time, trying to clean away every bit of that wax that may be down deep inside of the of certain parts of the instrument. So, but prolonged periods of heating could cause some of the non-metal parts maybe to soften up or also to damage the powder coat finish on some of the newer instruments. So, you want to stay away from a steam cleaner as much as you can and use the, just a mouth soap and water solution. That's what uh, certainly I would recommend that very strongly. As far as lubricating, you want to lubricate the working and bearing components with a a very thin film of a sewing machine or certain type of high-grade hand piece type of oil. Uh, you can also use a light application uh, of WD-40. That seems to work in loosening up the parts that work up and down or metal parts against each other. And you want to wipe up any excess uh, material to prevent the accumulation of any dust and grit. And for those areas where you know you're going to have stone, you can't keep stone away from certain parts of the instrument, a very thin coating of, of petrolatum is recommended so that it will allow you to wipe the stone off easily uh, off the metal surface of the instrument. For storage, uh, the articulator, to store your articulator uh, anytime it's not in use in a clean, dry atmosphere, which is free of plaster or any dust, carborundum, that area, so it doesn't accumulate on the instrument. If you're mounting a cast on your articulator, we uh, recommend you wait about 24 hours after mounting uh, so that you, you'll give time for the moist, moisture that's on the cast to dissipate. Because any moisture uh, dissipation from the stone in an unclosed area will cause uh, alkalinity of the stone mixture, which can damage uh, some of the articulator surfaces. So those are just some real quick uh, tidbits or some help for you to uh, know about as far as using the instrument and, and proper care and maintenance. So now we're going to go ahead and look at uh, actually calibrating a Danar instrument. Again, as I started out and said earlier, it's very important that you clean, 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 really take some time to clean the articulator up. As you see in the photograph here, there are some areas that you really want to pay particular attention to and that's anywhere where the condyle or the ball of the condyle is going to rest up against the articulator. Because if you have stone or wax underneath here, uh, it's not, it may cause a, a false reading on the verification gauge. So use some type of instrument here, just we're using a, a Q-tip, to really get inside here and clean out any wax on any area of the articulator where you might see a little bit of stone or wax uh, that's going to cause this to give you a, a false reading. For the Hanau instrument, and we'll look at this again a little later, the, the problem with tends to be in the area where the condo is riding up inside this track. And a lot of times you'll get a little stone grit in here or wax, and you want to make sure you get in here and clean it out as much as you can, certainly to the point of almost if it would look brand new the day you got it from the, uh, from the manufacturer in order for that ball to ride very smoothly and actually be able to move all the way back up into the position of the uh, what we'll call the clock or the condo area to lock it in place in the future position. For your Whitmix instruments, uh, the same the same here as far as cleaning. You want to make sure that uh, any area here, we, a lot of times when I service uh, instruments, we usually find a lot of stone or wax that's kind of wedged in this area here. So you want to get inside and clean this out as much as you can. Uh, also, this is a good point. To, I want to point out that we get a lot of stone or we see a lot of stone or wax that could be built up around this little, this little step in. So take a sharp instrument and really get in here and kind of uh, take out any wax or stone that could have somehow have gotten built up in this area. Uh, this is also a good time to check and make sure all the screws work properly, uh, make sure that your centric latch is actually working properly. So you want to do a real quick check over the instrument before you start attaching the gauge. Uh, same thing here for our tracking instruments. It's kind of hard, uh, but you have to get inside here with something to clean out this area because stone uh, or wax will get lodged in back here. And normally if we, if we see an instrument that could be out of calibration, once we clean those areas out and put them on our gauges, they seem to work fine. It's just that if you're not used to using the instrument, you may not think that you're having, uh, that could be the problem. Something as simple as cleaning out all the areas in the deep recesses of the instrument in order for it to work uh, the way it should. Any areas where you're going to be attaching the uh, verification gauge to the member of the instrument, you want to have clean. So where this the part of the gauge is going to go on that part of the instrument, you want to make sure that you clean it out as clean as you can so that this fits flush up against the uh, of the base or the member of the articulator. And also looking at this, you'll notice how on the 300 series, and I'll probably mention this again later on, there, there are two little depressed areas here, concave areas. 
that's where these little these little feet would, would slide into. You want to make sure that you get inside here and clean out any wax or stone that could be resting or hiding inside here so this gate does uh, seep fully onto the base of that uh, upper member of the articulator. So once you get the, uh, you're ready to attach the verification gauge, you want to raise the size of the pin, and then you want to go ahead, you'll see that there's the knob here that we used for the mounting plate. You're going to remove the knob, and you're going to seat the verification gauge on the upper member, and you're going to use the screws that have been supplied or provided with the verification gauge to attach to your, your instrument, which is the, we'll attach it to the instrument, and then we're ready, and you also, then once you get that done, you want to engage the centric latch. Put your articulator back together, engage the latch, and now we're ready to check what we call the vertical position. And we do this by closing the upper and lower half of the upper member together and using a small strip of shim. In this case, it's two thousandths of an inch uh, thick. You want to put it between the upper and lower gauges. And you check it. We recommend you check it in four locations. at 1 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock, and 11 o'clock position. What you would like to see is there should be a slight tug or holding of the shim as you see in the picture uh, depicted here. So with the, everything's closed down, and we see that there is a slight grab on the, on the shim as the hand is trying to pull it away from uh, where, where the gauges are coming together. So in order, again, in order to do this, the upper member of the articulator must be locked securely against the lower member and using the centric latch. And make sure that all the screws that, you're, that may be on the, that is on the articulator are locked tight uh, so there's no movement giving you a false reading. So what happens, or what do you do, if you put your gauges together and you see that there is a, there is a the vertical is open slightly, and what I have done what I've done here is I've kind of kind of animated the block on an articulator, and I realized or understand that the gauge is a lot, lot it's open a lot more than you would actually probably see on some instruments. So I'm kind of showing you what you might see when you close the two halves together is you might see a gap on the anterior portion of your instrument. <clears throat> so what we're going to do now is I'm going to talk to you how to talk you through how to uh, make that adjustment. What you're going to do then is there are set screws. If you look at the back of the articulator, there are two set screws on the back portion of the articulator. The top set screw allows you to loosen up the, the post that you see here coming out of the upper member, and that, that just loosens up the post so you can make some adjustments. So there are, uh, you would loosen the set screw on both sides. The lower, the bottom set screw allows you to either raise or lower the conger post. So as you see in this picture, by turning the set screw clockwise, you will see a slight upward movement of the con of the conger of the ball or the post, the conger post or shaft. If you were rotated counterclockwise, then of course you will see the opposite. The, the shaft will lower itself into the upper member, and these are very slow movements. Just as when you unlock the screw that you that I mentioned earlier here, you only want to loosen it maybe two or three turns to where it's loosened itself. It's backed away from that shaft. And the same thing here. Any move that you make with the lower set screw, it's, they're just slow movements. But as you make an adjustment, you will notice that the post will start to lift itself up. And by lifting up the back portion of the post, like you see here in this picture, by raising the post, it actually causes the upper part of the articulator, the anterior part of the articulator, to close down, therefore closing that gap. So slow movement on either side or both sides in some cases will cause the anterior portion of the articulator to lower itself down to where you see the gap will, will actually finally close itself down to be uh, flattened against the, uh, against the, where the gates are flat against each other. At this point here, then you, only, you may want to go ahead and double check. Now, what I'm going to show you here very quickly is what do you do if you see a vertical gap that is open only on one side? So if you look at this picture, we see that we have a catch. There's some tug going on on, on the patient's right-hand side, or as we're looking at the picture to your left, there's a tug in this area here. But let's just say what happens if the, this was open, so you, the paper was not grabbing in this area. What you would do then is you would only lo unloosen and, and lift one side, or actually the patient's right side of the articulator. So as I'm raising this collar post that you can't see now, but the collar post of the shaft inside this collar element, it's actually raising this part of the articulator, causing this side of the articulator to close down. So raising up, 
is going to cause rotator to close down in this area and thereby closing the gap that you may uh, have noticed. So if it's, if it's open pretty much from right to left, then you would raise both posts. But if it's only open on one side, you would go to the opposite uh, post and raise that shaft or post up to close the, the, the area that's open. So that's what you're going to do uh, when you're trying when you find an area that's only open on one side. Now, I have talked to people who said that they're when they're going to adjust their articulator and they're using the the, the Danar, if they unscrew it too far, then the post falls all the way down to the uh, to the upper member that uh, we're, we're going to, I'm going to show you in just a minute. So and they get a little concerned about well now what do I do because the whole post is dropped and what do I do next? Well. What you, what you will notice is if you lift up this corner shaft, you notice that there's a, a groove that's cut out into the part of the shaft. I'm giving you two views of it here, one from the side. And really all you're going to do then is if that happens is you would just go ahead and that, and the reason that happens is probably because you back this out too far and any weight that you may have had on the articulator, it causes the shaft to fall down. So by what you're going to do is take that, the uh, slotted area of the shaft, that I described to you or showed you, and you're going to just slide it back up until the, so the top part of this groove that you see right here is, is even with the upper member like we have right here, and you can just kind of rotate this back. You actually want to lock it back in, just snug it in, and you can take your sets, your Allen wrench, and then go back and just start and start making your adjustments. Putting this in at that position kind of evens everything out. That's usually kind of a good starting place to uh, adjust your articulator. So if, you're, if the shaft does fall because you've unloosened it too much, don't uh, be too concerned about it. You can reposition it, as I just showed you, and then you can go ahead and make your adjustment uh, to, to the articulator as we're describing to recalibrate it. So there's the shaft. Don't worry about it. You're just going to put it back in, and then you're ready to um, check the calibration of the instrument. So once you make adjustments to the end, if the articulator is open in the vertical position, once you make those adjustments, I would suggest that you go ahead and check the verification gauge, use the verification gauge, and, and check and see if it drops freely through the holes that you see in this picture. Maybe that's, that's the only area of the instrument where it could have been out of calibration, or more so out of calibration, not so much alignment, but out of calibration. And you just want to verify that they, the, the verification can will drop through. If it drops through, then you're pretty much, you've already recalibrated the instrument uh, if it was out only in the uh, vertical position. So the question then is, if it doesn't go through, then what if it's out in a horizontal or lateral position as you see in this photograph? So you see here, that with the gauge on, we are off. The hole is out of alignment and looks like it's off and also not only anterior, but also to the, in the lateral position. So now what do we do to make this adjustment? Well, we're going to start by, if you look on top of the, this little upper member, this, this bar here, there, there's, you'll see two holes on either side. Those holes, by loosening those holes, it allows you to take the upper member and slide it to the right or to the left and also forward and backwards. So once you loosen those four holes on that top bar, you're going to see this is going to free up this upper member and it's going to, so you're going to be able to slide it around until you can actually line up the holes on the verification gauge. And at that point, you would place your, your dowel into the verification gauge and then start going back through the process of re-securing or re-locking the articulator. Now, I suggest that when you're locking the articulator, you want to use a crisscross pattern to tighten the set screw. So if you look in the photograph here, we're going to tighten one side here, and we're going to go across to the opposite side and tighten this screw. And then we're going to move back over and do the, the same with the other two screws that are left. And you're going to lock those down. So, it's very simple to reset this articulator if it's out of alignment. And I would just go ahead and, and loosen uh, the four screws, reposition it, put in your dowel pin, and then go in and reset or relock the screws as you see here in this, in this picture that I'm showing you on this slide. Of course, once you're done, you want to, uh, again, after you make your tighten, uh, your tighten down your screws, you want to remove the dowels and you want to use the verification pin to see that it drops freely uh, through the hole. Now, if, if there's some reason you've tried all these steps and you just you, it fails the test or you're not able to make the adjustments, then certainly, certainly we suggest you can send it back to the factory and we can certainly try to reset or recalibrate it for you. But you'll see, once you start to use this, 
this is a very easy process. It's very easy to use, uh, very simple, and uh, we, I don't think you have any problems at all using this gauge on with the Danar instrument actually set, resetting the instrument as I've just uh, described to you. <clears throat> so now I'm going to go ahead and move on and talk a little bit about the verification gauge for the Hanau articulator. For the Hanau articulator, you can verify the top to bottom or the height for the flatness uh, using the gauge. And also you can verify uh, the Hanau in front to back or the, what we call the anterior posterior areas. Now you can also verify and calibrate side to side uh, or your lateral position. So what this is saying is, I'll kind of restate that, with the verification gauge, really the only thing that you can do is you can verify that the articulator is in calibration, top to bottom or front to back, but the only thing you can really calibrate would be the side to side movement. So with the verification gauge, the only thing you can really do on the hand, using the handout instrument is, is to recalibrate if it's out side to side. And also note that the, uh, the verification gauge does not work with the 96H2 handout mate or the ultimate. So let me walk through this that we do on the handout instrument. Now, the dial pins that you have that, we, that I've been talking about that come with the gauges, they're actually used to hold the articulator in place as your adjustments are being made. I kind of talked about that when I told you about to place them, but I just again kind of remind you what those, what certain parts of the gauges are used for. So the dial pins, you place them in the little holes that you see on either side of the device, the gauge, and it allows you to hold it in place for you while, you, while you're locking the instrument in place. So those of you who have done any calibration before where we didn't have this system, you almost had to hold things with your hands or with your fingers in order to lock things in place. This makes it a lot simpler for you because this is doing it for you. So it kind of frees up some of the, you know, the your, a hand that you normally have to use to try to hold things in place while you lock it in at the same time. As I said earlier, you want to make sure that you thoroughly clean all surfaces of the instrument. And again, I'm showing you the area where you'll probably find most uh, of the area where you probably do more of the, most of the cleaning. Because any of the smallest amount of debris that, that, that you leave will give you or could give you an inaccurate reading on the verification gauge when you're using it. You want to attach a verification gauge to the upper and lower member. And as I said before, just follow how they're labeled. And you're going to attach them. This is the, the thicker member that I was talking about earlier where you would use the longer screw that's provided. It comes with a long screw and a short screw, so you would use the longer one. Once the gauges are attached and you lock the centric pins uh, where against so this, you make sure the conduit is all the way up against the, the collar element or what we call the clock of the articulator as far as the handout goes. So make sure they're locked in. And then you can check your, uh, your the, the ability or the gap that you, if you, there's any between the upper and lower member, again, placing a small strip of shim, about two thousandths of an inch thick, between the upper and lower gauges. And again, check it in four different positions uh, at the 1, 5, 7, and 11 o'clock. And there should be a slight tug or holding of the shim if it is in uh, calibration. And you want to check and see the verification pin will drop through the hole. So the only adjustment, again, as I said earlier, that can be made with the handout verification gauge is in the lateral position. So we're going to talk about that uh, briefly. So to make that adjustment, if you look at this photograph, on top of what we call the upright post on the lower member, there is a set screw. There's one for each side. You're going to loosen the set screws, and when you do that, it's going to allow you to move the hand out the upper member side to side. And so to make this adjustment, you would put your gauges uh, on the instrument and the dowel pins placed in position. Using your thumbs, just very slight pressure, you're just going to move each of the, the shafts toward the center of the articulator. They will, they will only go so far and they will stop. Once you get them in and you're holding pressure against that uh, shaft, then you're just going to come back up with your, your wrench and you're going to lock Excuse me. You're going to lock the uh, the set screws back in place. So it's very simple to adjust the lateral position on the handout instrument. Basically, two screws push the collar shaft into the center evenly, so that and the gauge is going to make sure that you're, you're you're doing this evenly, and then you're going to lock the set screw back in place. So it's very simple to 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 set the handout instrument. Then you want to verify that when you slid everything over and lock them in, that they are, they are in their proper position. So you'll do this with the uh, verification pin uh, by sliding it through or having it drop through the hole. 
if the instrument fails, either test your, or you can't make the adjustments, and again, send it back to the factory and we will sort of recalibrate that for you. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about the witness verification gauge and the stuff that you would take. There's a little bit of difference uh, between each instrument, but so we're, that's why I'm covering all three of them. Uh, with the verification gauge for the WITMIX, it includes an upper and lower gauge, again with matching serial numbers, and two thumb screws. And there's actually a longer screw for the lower member because of the WITMIX's AccuMount mounting system. So if you look at this picture here on the screen here, we have this thickness, which is the upper plate or the upper member of the articulator. But on the lower member, we actually still have, we have the thickness of the plate plus we have the thickness of what we call the AccuMount plate. So therefore, that longer screw that you would get with this kit or with this system that's what you're going to use on the lower member because it has to go a little bit long, has to be a little bit longer to fit through both thicknesses uh, that you're going to have of the plate and the action mount plate. Also comes with uh, two extension screws for the non-magnetic type of articulator and a verification pin as well as two dowel pins. With the Whitmix articulator, you're able to verify top to bottom for flatness or the height uh, between the top and bottom. You can verify and calibrate side to side. Uh, position as well as front to back. The verification gauge does not work with the model 8500. So again, here, if any ver uh, ver if vertical discrepancy exists, then you would have to send this, uh, the articulator back to Whitmix so that we can reposition and recalibrate the probably using uh, probably by resetting the uh, AccuMount plate. So in order to calibrate or check to, verif to verify the interchangeability of the alignment of the articulator, you want to raise inside the guide pin. You want to, again, thoroughly clean the instrument, get all of the wax and other debris out of, the, uh, out of your way. And if you're using the quick mount magnet system, you want to remove the magnet so they can use the screws that are supplied uh, for the verification gauge. So this system, it, you only need to buy the one gauge, but it has this, but you will have to remove the magnet in, in order to check for verification. So in this picture, we're showing you how to remove the magnet. And then using the screws uh, supply, you're going to go ahead and attach a verification gauge uh, to, to your instrument. Again, I mentioned earlier, there are two sizes. There are two short screws and one long screw. And we now know that the long screw goes on the lower member. If your articulator has the screw type mounting system, all you need to do is to attach the extension screw to the mounting plate screw. And this will allow you to use the gauge in this fashion. And so before I go any further, I just want to, again, remind you that as you're cleaning the articulator, it would be nice to certainly take a look at the cleans you see in the photograph. But also, you want to make sure that you take out any wax or stone that could have built up in this area here. For some reason, this small area tends to capture some stone or wax, and this will affect how the gauge fits on uh, to your instrument when you're going to try to verify. But to go ahead and get back to what we're saying here, you want to attach the extension screw to an mounting plate screw. And then, of course, uh, attach your verification gauge to the articulator. And then, as we said earlier, in the previous with previous instruments, uh, you can check the height uh, or the the flatness of the instrument. And you want to do this by placing the strip of uh, shim between the upper and lower member and checking those same four positions that we mentioned earlier. So, what do you do if you discover that your articulator is out of alignment in the horizontal or the anterior and posterior position? So with the Whitmix instruments, what you will do is, if you turn the articulator over, you'll notice there are, there are two leg screws at the bottom of the instrument. Using an Allen wrench or a hex wrench of, uh, of, the same, of the proper size, you're going to unlock the leg screw, and you're going to only unlock it and turn it, I would say, probably about three or four turns is all you need to do. Once it pops loose, I would say maybe one full turn or a turn and a half will make, should make it loose enough for you that you can make some adjustments. So you're going to loosen the leg screw. Now, uh, I've, I've calibrated hundreds and hundreds of articulators out in the field. And once you you kind of get an idea of maybe you can really make a calibration by only loosening one leg screw, and it sometimes it'll make it quicker. Uh, but if you find it difficult uh, doing this, I would suggest you might unloosen both leg screws, because that's going to give you real freedom of movement of the upright post when you're trying to line up the verification gauge. We'll kind of go through this uh, here coming up. If you unloosen both leg screws, as you see in this photograph, it's going to allow this part of the instrument right, that you see right here, it's going to allow this to move pretty much freely in all directions, side to side, forward and back. So, 
and not not a lot, but you'll notice some slight movement. You'll see how this moves just real sliding down here where it comes and touches the base of the articulator. But you will be able to move it thoroughly enough to where you can align the gauges up so you can place the dalpia. If you look at this photograph here, we know that the upright post needs to be moved forward. And we're looking at this. I'm looking at this post right here. Since I, with the gauge attached, it looks like that I'm really out more on this side of the instrument, the patient's left side of the uh, left side. But it looks like we're out, and we're out probably uh, certainly anterior posterior, and probably maybe just a little bit side to side. But what I would try to do here in this case is I'll probably loosen up this leg screw, make my adjustment, see if I can slide it over, place my dowel pin in, and then go ahead and, and start to secure the instrument. So this you may be able to get away with maybe undoing just the one. Uh, one side of the upright post, the leg. Now you see here what I'm doing is with my thumb and my index finger, I'm actually sliding the leg or this upright post forward, and that's allowing me, as you see here, just by doing that, it's actually allowed me to move this into the correct position where I want it. Now I can see where I'm lined up, and I can place my dowel into the check gauge. I've also placed the dowel on the opposite side, but I want to make sure I can put my gate, my dowels in here, and now I'm able to. Uh, start locking the uh, legs back down, uh, hopefully of setting these back in or recalibrating or putting it back into alignment. So you see that's what I've done here. I actually got it the position. I placed my dowel, so it holds the alignment for me. Then I rotate and turn it over, and you see with the dowel in both positions here, I can start tightening uh, the leg that I, perhaps that I was loose. Now, if you're loosening both legs, what I would recommend you do then is anytime you're making any tightening, do them in, in slow and small increments. If you go too fast, what you might do is you might cause one of the valves to become very tight. And you probably might find it difficult to remove it. But if you slowly alternate between the legs in small increments, you can actually put your finger on the valve and still see if it slides up and down. Uh, it'll be a little snug, but you should be able to slide it up and down. If you notice that a valve gets locked in as you as you made a tightening turn, you might want to loosen that leg up the dowel is loose again, and it may be with a little finger pressure, kind of like what I showed you here, maybe while holding the finger pressure here, go ahead and lock it down to see if you can hold that leg in position as you're locking it. So it is, it can be um, easier at times, especially if you're doing this for the first time with the Whitmix instrument, to maybe loosen both legs, and it'll certainly be easier for you to, to line everything up, place your dowel in, and then start locking the instrument down. But as you get more uh, familiar with using the instrument, you will notice how, or you can probably really only use or unlock one leg to really get it into calibration for you. Once you lock everything in and your dial slide out, you want to go ahead and take your verification pin and you want to slide it or have hopefully line it up with the hole and see that it drops all the way through. So that it's also a very simple uh, device to use to calibrate your instrument uh, fairly fast. Now, one thing with all the instruments that have a screw-type system, or actually all the instruments uh, other than the Mark 300 series, as far as removing the verification gauge, what I recommend you do is unscrew the knob about a third of the way out, as you see on the left picture, and then with the, with the screw about a third of the way out, just push down on the knob. And what that will do is that will actually unloosen or cause the, the verification gauge, the bottom of the Gauge to release the collets that are holding the gauge onto the pin. So unscrew it, push the knob, and it should pop this gauge down. And then you can go ahead and continue unscrewing out the knob and completely removing the gauge. So it's something we want you to do or try to do instead of just grabbing the gauge with your hand and kind of just kind of uh, rotate it and, and rotate, you know, kind of pull it off. You should use the knob of the screw to pop it out, to pop it loose for you, and then continue unscrewing it and then remove the gauge. It, it will prevent the collet from seizing up at some point in time. You want to make sure that these are collets here that lock into the pin, but once you release it, they, they open up to allow the gauge to be removed uh, fairly quickly, but easily. The Mark 300 series articulator uh, allows you, what this does is it actually just allows you to check for verification. So it includes an upper and lower gauge, you know, matching serial numbers, and it only has a verification, one verification pin. Because with this instrument, you're not going to be able to do any verification or any calibrating in the field. Uh, this is stuff where, as you, you'll notice, where in the area where everything is attached to the member, there are no screws holding the shaft of the articulator in position. It's held by this resin material. Um, we call it it's a pot 
routing uh, type of uh, uh, procedure that we go through have actually locked and hold the pin in place. So there's no way to make any adjustments. What would happen is you'd have to bring it back to the plant and we would recalibrate it for you if it is out of, out of alignment. The good thing about this, though, is because of the way this is designed or the, the way we go through potting this, we find that there's hardly any movements that, that, that no movements at all to be speak of, that are really coming from this shaft being moved around because it is locked in. So that's the good side of this. So really all you need to do is just check, make sure that it's ver uh, verified that it's still in calibration. Um, if, if it is out of calibration, we just send it back to the plant so that we can repot, reposition the post. So I'm just trying to go to my next slide here. So you're going to verify uh, side to side and front to back alignment. You slide the verification bin through the holes on each side of the gauge and let it, hopefully it draws through. If it does, it's in calibration. If it's out of calibration, and we'll send it back to the plan, we'll re we will reposition the instrument for you. So how do these new gauges improve on other products that we've had in the past? Well, as I said, the, 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 you know, the field inspection gauge is very difficult to use. It also varies by person's visual pers uh, perspective. And it is, it is uh, again, kind of technique sensitive. With the handout gauge block, uh, the members, as you're tightening the gauge blocks on the articulator, the members could slightly rotate if you didn't know to hold them in position. Just like when you tighten down a mounting plate, sometimes if you're not careful, the mounting plate might want to turn just a little bit on you. And, uh, and the calibration is actually measured by, by the touch of the hand or uh, actually running a real small shim of uh, a, a gauge up and down the, the, the block to see if they were in calibration. With the Whitmix check system, uh, again, the members uh, on the check device, they may be turned slightly, but they can still pass. And the calibrations were made within certain, certain tolerances of the ring that I showed you when the ring goes on the, the cylinders. We, we let them slide up and down, but there's certainly with a, a certain amount of tolerances that we allow uh, in order for that, that ring to slide. The new gauges will verify with the greater accuracy uh, to keep your articulation and calibration. So therefore, you have certainly greater confidence in the interchangeability of the instrument. By checking those instruments, uh, I would say frequently, if, if, especially if you know that you're sending articulators out from one lab to another or from your office to a lab, I would certainly say if you have a gauge in your office, you might want to uh, verify uh, just put them on the gauge, uh, maybe before you send out the next case, just verify those are what you're sending is still accurate. If you are working uh, with a laboratory, there are some laboratories that they have the gauge, they will check the instrument for you if you send the instrument to them, or you can do the you can do the same for them. Uh, find a way to work with the laboratory that you can verify the instruments on, on one gauge if you're close uh, within a driving distance of, of the laboratory that you're working with. Um, if for some reason you need to return your articulator to Whitmix, basically uh, what you're going to do is you're going to call a customer service department at the number listed on the screen here. And once you receive an RMA number, if you have a Whitmix articulator, you return it to the Whitmix uh, Corporation address here in Louisville. Or if you have a handout Dana articulator, you would return it to Whitmix Corporation out in Fort Collins, Colorado. So those are the plants that handle the, that build and assemble the different types of articulators. And those are those were those that's where you would send them once you get an RMA number from our customer service rep. So I thank you for your time, and I hope that you have a, a, a great job and uh, of calibrating the instrument. You find it easy to use, and uh, wish you much luck uh, in your profession. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. At this time, I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, we do have one question already. Um, it is, um, is the same gauge for the magnetic Whitmix articulators, um, are they the same? Can you use the same, Jim? Yes, the, the gauges are the same. Uh, so with the magnet, you would just unscrew the, the magnetic plate and then use the screws that are supplied. Uh, if your articulator has a screw-type mounting system on it, then you would, you would use the extension pins that I showed you in the slide. So it's one gauge. Great. Um, are there any other questions? Well, I don't have any other questions coming in, so if um, that is all, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. Um, just as a reminder, oh, we got a question right now. Uh, can cases be transferred between models of DANAR? Can cases be transferred? Between models of DANAR articulators. Oh, as I said earlier, yeah, I, you know, if your articulator is of the same model, uh, certainly within the instrument, I, Certainly, I think you can certainly, there's a, uh, 
high degree of uh, probably that that certain that that would happen. What we don't want you to do is we don't really want you to take cases that are on a different model and try to go to another uh, different uh, another separate model because there could be some different uh, slight differences. But if, I think that on the if you're using the verification gate and you and again as we said earlier you can use all the uh, all the different types of data or instruments. Again, you should be able to go ahead and as long as you verify them uh, and make sure they're on calibration, they should go. They should be able to go from uh, a case can go from one instrument to another. However, just be concerned that with some instruments you may have a straight tracking fossa. On another instrument, you may have a curve, so it would not work exactly the same if you go from one instrument that has a different type of feature uh, between even even between the different models. So I would be careful about that. Great. Um, no more questions are coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and end today's webinar. Just as a reminder, you will receive information on how to receive your credit within 24 hours. In addition, if you missed anything or want someone else to view this webinar, it will be posted on our website um, by the end of this week or early next, so you should go check it out. And again, thanks for everybody for attending. Have a great day.